All right, looks like we're achieving critical mass. I think I hit the record button. So I just wanna let you know that we're recording these meetings as we do all our member series meetings um, and you will have access to the recording um, after the meeting. Um, you'll get a communication um, when you'll have access to the recording as well as a link to all the handouts that are gonna be referred to during this conversation. Um, for those who, who don't know, I'm Gregory Jackson. I'm Associate Director for Membership and Partnership at NAEP. Really happy to have you here. This is our member series for March. And I wanna thank all of you for taking time uh, to join us in these meetings. They're designed to be interactive. So there's definitely opportunity for sharing um, and input. Um, that's the value add of NAEP. It's building community um, through our work. And uh, before I turn the agenda over to uh, Michael Tinsley, NAEP um, president and to uh, Richard Montgomery, um, director for public policy, I just wanna highlight a couple of things as it relates to the work that we do in these meetings and in, in NAEP in general. Um, we really worked hard over the last uh, couple of months in creating an agenda for these member meetings. Um, and I just wanna reflect for a minute on our collective accomplishments. Um, with your support and with your input, we were able to identify the priority areas that members are concerned and interested in, and we use surveys that go out periodically throughout the year to pinpoint the key areas that are important to you. So we're not just making it up. This isn't just Greg Jackson's idea of what we should be talking about. This is a culmination of your work and your input. And I wanna continue to encourage you to respond to our um, surveys uh, that'll be going out shortly after the summit and during the summit as well. It's very important in creating and building community. So we've identified these priority areas and the way they've landed this year were in the following areas, storytelling, humanizing data, um, equity and special education, ensuring inclusion and support in CTE, empowering young women in non-traditional careers, um, empowering adult learners, lifelong learning, fostering cultural competence in STEM, um, this current one, public policy update, and um, and we have one coming up in May, which you'll get an announcement about um, supporting English language learners, empowering multilingual education in CTE. Um, our focus is equity, it's, our focus is CTE, our focus is STEM, and these meetings are an opportunity for the community to come together, oftentimes our speakers in these fireside chats are members like you, um, whether they're state members or affiliate members and our partners. And so I just wanna applaud you. I wanna applaud um, and thank you for uh, participating in this process and hopefully that we can continue with this partnership moving on. So that's me and I'm getting off my soapbox. Before I turn it over to Michael, though, I just want to acknowledge um, the foundation uh, board president, Dr. Liu. Hello, Dr. Liu. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> and NAEP CEO, Brittany Brady, who is also joining us. Um, so I just want to acknowledge our leadership. Hello, hello, hello. And so I will now turn it over to NAEP president and public policy chair uh, for the executive committee, Michael Tisney. It's all yours, Michael. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gregory, for all your work. I also want to recognize Carol, who's on the call as well, as one of our uh, NAEP team members. Uh, she does a tremendous job behind the scenes to make sure that everything goes smoothly and that uh, as we get gear up for the NC, that those things are going off, going off very well. So I appreciate Carol and the rest of the team and their work uh, through this process. I am dropping in the chat today's agenda so that uh, you can you can look through that as you at your will, and then also as a as a summary as you um, look towards next week possibly getting this potential recording and the additional documents. Uh, I do want to first take time to introduce Richard Montgomery. He is our Director of Public Policy at NAEP. I want to give him a moment uh, to share about himself and then we can dive right into the rest of our agenda. Richard, welcome. 
Michael, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Richard Montgomery. I came on board as Director of Public Policy a month ago yesterday, and I really enjoy it, and I, I've really enjoyed working with the folks here and learning a lot already and uh, looking at Washington from a different, different perspective now. Um, I came here most recently from the Maryland State Bar Association. During my tenure there, I was Director of Legislative and Governmental Relations for 18 years. I got my start in advocacy at what is now called the Maryland Commission, excuse me, the uh, Maryland Civil Rights Commission. It was the Commission on Human Relations back then uh, as a discrimination investigator. And I did that simultaneously along with being uh, their new legislative liaison uh, in the state capital of Annapolis. Um, worked there for five years and then got hired into the governor's office as uh, deputy advisor to the governor uh, and stayed on into the next administration uh, with the following governor, two drastically different styles. So that taught me a lot about uh, advising uh, public policy figures. So I uh, spent a few years there. Uh, Anyway, as I said, I'm very, very happy to be here. And uh, Capitol Hill is kind of a new experience and I'm learning uh, differences in the processes and all that sort of thing. And right now what I'm gonna do is just go very quickly through and um, Brittany is gonna help me here with the screen sharing of the first document, which is the co uh, congressional uh, policy priorities. The first of which is a Stronger Workforce for America Act. That's the WIOA reauthorization organization uh, that's before the House that came out of the House Education and Workforce. Well, it hasn't come out yet. Uh, the good news is, well, first of all, it helps having the chair of the committee as basically your, your, your biggest advocate on the bill. Uh, so even though the bill has not moved out of committee at this point, uh, it remains in committee. But we, we saw really a couple of positive signs on this bill and another that I'll get to in just a couple of moments where you had individual members trying to sign on and actually signing on as sponsors. So whenever you have new members trying to be amended onto the bill as co-sponsors, that's, that's a positive sign. People don't jump onto a sinking ship. So we, we are looking forward to seeing this bill move pretty shortly. And it, it strengthens, it reauthorizes the program and also strengthens provisions related to uh, adult literacy and education. So uh, we're excited about that. Uh, scrolling down a bit, we're uh, also looking at uh, the, there we go, uh, the Paycheck Fairness Act by uh, Representative Rosa DeLauro and Senator Patty Murray. Either of those bills, should they pass, uh, would be something we'd be very excited about. Neither bill has progressed thus far. Uh, they both amend the Equal Pay Act of 1963. And what they're trying to do is strengthen provisions uh, related to anti excuse me, ad, related to retaliation. Uh, often when um, someone's called out for discriminating on the basis of race, sex, gender, what have you, especially gender, uh, they, they often try to retaliate against the person filing the charge. This bill tries to strengthen the provisions that, that, that curtail that. There are also uh, provisions that relate to focusing on um, acceptable employer defenses. So that's another part of that bill that, that we're very, very much into. Uh, scrolling down a bit farther uh, to the next, no, there we are right there. Uh, H.R. 6585, the Bipartisan Workforce PAL Act, uh, which really is one of, remarkably one of the most bipartisan bills that I've come across since we've been here, along with uh, WIOA. Um, Another bill that you've just had sponsors, new sponsors sign on to, in this case, they were all Democrats. So uh, that was sort of an interesting thing since they're in the minority right now. Um, this bill is, is, is making the guardrails clearer in terms of gainful employment above a certain income level. One of the things that the, the members were worried about in previous iterations and discussions of this, this legislation was that, okay, would, would these be storefronts for uh, jobs that really aren't real or aren't the type of job that this Pell legislation anticipates, that it's, that it's you know, high demand work and it's above poverty wages. So that's that's something that right now we're, we're pretty excited about. So anyway, I just wanted to cover those three things 
and then kind of turn it back over. Let's see, am I turning it over to Michael right now? Uh, actually, I am. So, Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and so just for, for those who are on the call, this as we get back into the regular monthly calls, this type of dive into the legislation that is currently uh, in committee, uh, potentially going to the floor is kind of where these discussions will normally reside as we meet monthly. This is an opportunity for you to join in and give any insights that you may have in, the, in, the, in these pieces of legislation. Or if there's other pieces of legislation uh, that's coming through Congress or that you've heard about that you really would like to know more about, please feel free to reach out to uh, any of us, and we're happy to add those to the docket or speak more about those. So Richard is doing a great job of maintaining uh, his list of uh, legislative priorities and those bills that are being introduced and where they are in the process. And he's mentioned uh, the two or three that are the most likely to be passed during this particular congressional session, especially as we are in a presidential year. Uh, so as we get to the summer and just immediately after the summer, there will be a lot of vacating of offices to go about. And the entire House, by the way, so everyone knows, all the House members are up for reelection every cycle. So every two years, they're up for re-election. And then a third of the Senate is up for re-election every two years for a six-year term. So uh, as we get into the summer and spur uh, summer and fall, uh, there will be less opportunities for things to pass. But as Richard already said, WIOA and uh, short-term Pell, those things are, are uh, bipartisan. And those typically will pass during the summer so that there can be some quick victories if, as representatives go back to their states uh, to uh, try to tout re-election possibilities. So thank you, uh, Richard, for bringing us up to speed on that. I do want to share a couple of things. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about the fiscal year 24 appropriations update. All right, this is going to get a little complicated because we're going to talk about fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25. So just so we're clear, the federal fiscal year begins October 1st. Fiscal year 24 began October 1st, 2023. Most of the states, their, fi their fiscal year starts July 1. So Congress purposefully, the federal government, purposefully starts at this beginning of the second quarter for states for when they enact their federal fiscal year. The reason they do that is that allows for states to have funding through the first quarter of the next fiscal year at the state level so they have federal funds because sometimes, and actually through the last six to eight years, it's definitely occurred more often than not, that the federal folks, con Congress, tend to not get things done uh, right by October 1st or just before October 1st. Sometimes they linger. And the fiscal year 24 that was just passed this weekend was supposed to begin October 1st of 23 and runs through uh, September 20, excuse me, September 30th of this 2024. So they are way behind in the process. We'll also in a few minutes talk about the president's fiscal year 25 budget, which is basically on track the way it's typically released is in February or March. And then Congress starts talking about that during the spring. And then they start having releases about the appropriations uh, that will be agreed upon uh, sometime during the summer so that they're ready for October 1st. So uh, as, I, as I say that, I do want to try to preface a little bit. It can be confusing, but this is something that we will continue to, to share about and, and provide um, presentations on so that you all as state members have that information and are able to um, separate that uh, within your mind. So for fiscal year 24 that we're currently in, there was a, there was a discussion about a, a potential shutdown that could occur if this wasn't passed by the end of March, simply because of the way things uh, were agreed upon uh, during the fall with Congress. So you know in the House side, they've went through a couple of different House speakers, and this has been about, about how, they have a, how they have passed appropriations. So there are 12 appropriations within Congress for different categories. And uh, back in the fall, actually back in uh, the, the early part of the winter, they approved the first six appropriations. And so at that point, uh, because of the agreement with the House Speaker, the Senate, uh, Majority Leader, and the President, that caused some turnover in the House in which they created or they uh, uh, got a new House Speaker. And so through, the, through those backdoor discussions, we had the next and final six appropriation bills for the fiscal year 24 that needed to become an agreement to. And had they not come to an agreement by the end of March, 
actually this past weekend, the, the, for the last week of March, there actually would have been a sequestration, and we can talk about that, that name later on, but sequestration that would have caused a, um, a redaction of funds for states around federal funds. But that did not happen. They had come to a, an agreement on the final six appropriations for a little more than $1.2 trillion uh, that we will be sharing out how that impacts education. Uh, and basically, if you look back to fiscal year 23, we're talking about basically a line item uh, level funding, as we typically call it. We've had about five or six years of increased funding in the Education Department and also the Department of Labor. Uh, but this particular fiscal year 24, basically, we see a level funding. And so we're moving forward now. There will, there will be no government shutdown. There will be no sequestration or loss of funds for the current fiscal year. Uh, but because of, of what was passed this weekend, basically, we have level set funding for the rest of this year, which goes through September. And um, uh, for through September of 2024 and what you'll be hearing about next from us will be the what the president has offered for the fiscal year 25 budget um, and then we'll talk about actually that process and the timeline that typically takes in any given year so I don't read slides very well I, I do present them to you and we will make sure that you get a copy of these so that you can share them at your leisure uh, within your home state or local agency all right, so I'll pause for a second about any um, information or questions about the fiscal 24 budget. If you're comfortable coming off mute, please do so or drop something in the chat. Otherwise, we will move on to the fiscal 25. So I'm, I'm going to leave uh, Richard to talk about the president's budget, but I do want to talk about the appropriations um, for fiscal year 25 and how that typically works. And Richard, if you'll watch the chat in case there's any questions while I'm speaking and then I'll do likewise for you as well, thank you. Um, so basically this slide here shows the process that the federal government takes in uh, doing the uh, pr approval process for appropriations or what we call the budget process. So the appropriations has to do again with the 12 different um, sectors uh, that get approved. So you see typically what happens in the early part of the, the year, February or March, the president actually releases his or her budget request. Um, in a divided government, and when I say divided, I mean you don't have the president and both houses of Congress of the same political party. Typically the uh, president's budget doesn't have a lot of weight in what Congress approves in a typical uh, session. If they happen to be of the same party, then that does influence uh, what Congress typically does and passes within uh, the House and Senate budget appropriations. But then in, uh, in the springtime, usually the House and Senate each meet, they decide upon how they're going to do that. And then uh, by spring and summer, uh, they then separate those out amounts. So what they would do is once they come to their agreement, typically in the spring of an overall amount, whatever trillions of dollars that amount is. And then in the spring slash summer slash fall, what they will do is they will appropriate an amount to each department, the federal government department. So let's say the Department of Education, uh, they will give an amount to that area. And so then then the uh, the individual committees can decide then how they're going to dev, uh, divide out those particular appropriation amounts within their, uh, with what's important for their particular Senate or House committee in education, for example. And then uh, once the House passes something, the Senate passes something, if they don't match up identically, then they have to do what's called a committee between the House and Senate. They will have individuals who represent both that will come together, usually the leadership of each, who will come behind closed doors and say, okay, we can give on this, you can give on that. And then they will come up with a final uh, passage for appropriations. And then that, as they approve that by, by each House and the Senate, when they agree on the exact same bill, then it goes to the president for signing. Uh, there is a there is a tendency if a, if the president doesn't agree, he or she can veto it, sending it back for a uh, three quarters majority uh, to approve, and that hasn't happened in recent years. So typically, those are all done between behind closed doors, so that, that appropriation process moves forward. But this is typically the calendar process, and again, as the president has released his budget. Uh, request for this year. It's come in March instead of early, instead of February, but that's about typical for the timeline, February, March. And then Congress, now that they just passed the fiscal year 24, they are in that mindset that they may decide now to try to go ahead and start the fiscal year 25 process, or because it's an election year, they may wait closer to time, and I mean past summer, 
to really have these discussions so they can use this on the campaign trail as they're all trying as the, the entire house and a third of the senate are trying to be um, uh, to be brought back to congress for another term so questions on that please drop them in the chat or come off mute we be happy to answer anything about those processes uh, that the feds take but uh, unless there's not any, I'm going to turn it back over to Richard. Richard, if you will talk to us about what the president put in his actual fiscal 25 budget request. Now, this is only the higher ed portion of the, the uh, president's fiscal year 25 budget proposal. And one of the things that Michael stressed to me when I first came on board, and you'll, you'll probably hear him mention it again in just a moment, is that what this, what, how this goes in as the president's suggestion the chances of it looking anything like this by the time Congress finishes whacking, hacking, and deliberating, and possibly as, as much as conference committee, which is probably a very strong likelihood, um, that would be kind of a miracle. As anyway, in the top left corner, let's start with the fact that you've got an overall Department of Education budget of 82.4 billion discretionary spending with an increase of three, uh, 3.13. Um, the one thing that I think that sort of jumped out at me is there were a couple of pieces on the right side that had no increases. Uh, the federal work study and federal supplemental educational opportunity grants uh, held constant and had no increases. Um, moving down to the left-hand side, uh, Student Aid Administration had a $6.125 million increase. Uh, strengthening HBCUs had a $35 million increase. Other significant increases involved on the right side, aid for institutional development, HCBUs, TCUs, HSIs, and AANAPSIs. I'm not sure I know what those are. Anyway, um, those saw an increase of $108 million. Uh, Post-secondary student success grant program got a $55 million increase. Uh, getting down toward the bottom, you had teacher quality assistant, excuse me, teacher quality partnership program, uh, $95 million appropriation suggestion with a $25 million increase. Hawkins Centers for Excellence program, $30 million suggested appropriation with a $15 million increase. So those are kind of some starting points just for illustrative purposes as to where, you know, where the uh, president, I keep wanting to say governor, where the president, uh, is sort of headed with this. But uh, if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. But other than that, I would turn it back to Michael. Very good. Thank you, Richard. Uh, again, so what Richard and I have been going through today is similar to what we'd be doing monthly about what's going on uh, within Congress, within uh, legislative pieces, or even things that the administration, federal administration of the president has uh, shared uh, related to Department of Education, Department of Labor, or similar entities. Uh, by the way, uh, Richard, when you went through some of those uh, acronyms, those typically are, are other uh, post-secondary institutions that are minority serving or historically black colleges or Native American and so forth. So some of those abbreviations um, you know, in education, we have probably the most uh, collection of uh, biggest collection of acronyms that there are. But uh, nonetheless, uh, so we want to take a moment uh, as again, if you have questions or comments and you don't want to come off chat, please uh, drop those into the chat. Uh, Richard, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the uh, legislation page that we have at NAEP and maybe where we're going uh, in the future with that? I'd be happy to. Uh, and Brittany, that's the final uh, link. It's the link to our frontline legislation page, uh, which is something that I'm actually quite excited about uh, as we uh, sort of wrap up the 118th Congress. Uh, we'll have updates on this page, which is in the public policy uh, portion of the NAEP website. And what you're going to see here is you're going to see a bunch of updates as we wind down through the fall and winter of some culmination uh, what, of activity in Perkins 5, Higher Education Act, uh, ESSA, uh, Workforce, you know, WIOA, uh, Title IX. There are going to be updates in each of these areas as to what happened as we wind down and including in January when the 119th Congress is sworn in, we'll have some finalization hopefully, uh, of most of these things that uh, we've been following uh, in each of these issue areas. Uh, and as the 119th Congress uh, is seated, then we'll, we'll pick up there. 
Excellent. Very good. All right. So I guess we want to move uh, and transition into talking about policy day as at the actual summit. So if you're coming uh, to the summit, so the uh, we abbreviated NC, uh, National Summit for Educational Equity, uh, what our um, organization is um, known for is, is fighting for educational equity. Um, and that definition is broadened uh, as, as things occur each year within our society. But uh, we're going to talk about the Day on the Hill, which is, again, going back to the roots of who we are as an organization, is um, advocating for the rights of uh, gender and that now and any intersecting uh, special population within that as well. So we want to make sure that we talk about Policy Day, what's going to be available. So, Richard, you want to start that discussion? You're on mute, Richard. Uh, we're looking forward to having as many members as possible. I'm not sure uh, uh, the most recent count, Caroline sent it to us this morning. Um, but uh, I think we're about to go into the agenda of that. Uh, we're, one of the things we're looking for is having members uh, listen to our keynote speaker, our advocacy keynote speaker that morning. Uh, and at some point we'll be, after the morning programming is done, we'll be taking off uh, in a sort of an uber caravan to capitol hill uh and then we'll have i, I guess among other things uh the, the, those of you who may have made uh arrangements to, to speak to your members uh that would be take, taking place yeah so a little bit more with that yeah thank you richard so uh we'll start that morning with our about 9 a.m with our speaker and then uh, around in there were thereabouts between 10 and 11 of uh, dis, uh, disassembling uh, from the hotel. And as, as Richard said, going to meet on Capitol Hill. We're gonna share additional information about if we're gonna meet on the east side uh, where the mall area is of the uh, Capitol building, uh, going down to the visitor center, or if we're gonna meet on the west side, which is where there, if you're not familiar with DC, there's some roundabout drop off spots on the west side uh, with, the, with the front lawn, if you will, of the Capitol building. So we'll, we'll talk about those details and share those out uh, in probably next week with, uh, with the group that is planning to attend with us. And then the plan is to get a photo together um, with the Capitol in the background that we utilize for the website and then members can use as they go home as well. Um, it's always a, a fun time. And then it's about what are the other options after that? So after we meet, there's a visitor center there for the Capitol. Hopefully, as Richard said, you've already or started making uh, calls and emails to your legislative offices uh, that were within your home states so that uh, you can meet with your legislators and share about your priorities or if you'd like, NAEP's priorities as well um, so that uh, your members uh, know as a constituent what's important to you and what you'd like to um, for your members to know about that. Uh, Richard did mention there is a Lyft slash Uber option that NAEP can pay for that uh, going to the Capitol. You will be responsible for transportation home on your own dime. And I say home as in the hotel. Um, Many people will walk, some will not be comfortable with that, and then you'll make arrangements. We'll talk about making sure you have a group. So with a Lyft or an Uber possibility, you wanna to try to get two, three other people with you at least to ride in the Uber to go to Capitol Hill. So we'll talk more about that over the next couple of weeks and see some emails and, and contacts from uh, Nate discussing those and how you can make that uh, a possibility if you decide to go on the Hill. Um, and then of course your afternoon, um, for the uh, summit day, day on the hill will be on your own. Several uh, members will decide to go visit museums. Others will uh, may want to go visit uh, not inside the White House. You have to make those reservations long ahead of time, usually three to six months, and submit your name. They do a background check and all that, but kind of tour the grounds of the White House on the outside, kind of look where that's at. Uh, some folks may want to go to, um, like I said, museums or even uh, other um, places like the Library of Congress and so forth. But most of those take reservations ahead of time. Most all of those are free. You just, you have to do your planning, due diligence and planning and submit your name of your group and so forth to be able to do that. So all that stuff uh, is still a possibility if, if you get on the phone immediately, but usually those take several months uh, planning time for those particular uh, places to allow folks to come in, especially any kind of group. Um, Richard had mentioned uh, before this call about the uh, app around me. So Richard, if you want to speak about that and anything else that relates to Policy Day that you think would be beneficial to membership. I do. Michael, thank you. Um, for those of you who don't have it, one of the things I find very useful in traveling 
is in, in addition to your maps where you can you can program it to walk uh, as opposed to using your car from this place to that place at a city, the app called Around Me, just Around Me, uh, you can you can use it to find a bank. You can use it to find a Kinko's. There's one, by the way, across the street in case you need one uh, at the hotel. Um, I jokingly point out that I use it to find ice cream shops at night, uh, but there are it, it's just really a wonderful app to use in conjunction with your maps, especially in a city where things, you know, there's something around that you want. You just don't know exactly where it is. So that would be something I, I would I would suggest. Very good. Thank you, Richard. Also, uh, in the agenda that's attached, there are a couple links there. If you're not sure who your uh, senators are or your House representatives, there's a link for each of their websites. Uh, and then for the House membership, if you can type in your zip code, uh, that will give you your specific state members for that zip code. And then your senators, they are listed alphabetically there by the state, so you can find out who your two state senators are. Uh, that we could start the conversation if you want to send an email or if you would even like to pick up the phone and call them and try to set up a meeting. Uh, if you have multiple people coming in from your state, it is very logical that you do so in a, in a buddy type system. So if a congressional member or staffer can meet with four people from your state, that's easier than making four different meetings for each one of you individually, right? So if you think about that, that, that from, the, from the state member side, we are not the only conference in town that week, by the way. We have other educational conferences going on that week, so there'll be other folks in town. Probably more than likely, many of them will be visiting the Hill with members as well. So the sooner the better that you can make a reservation, if you will, uh, to uh, set up a meeting with your state member, either in the House or the Senate, the better you all are. Um, Brittany uh, or Lou, I'm going to look to you all. Any other comments about Day on the Hill or the, or the summit in general that uh, we need to, to share? I would just add a question about the fact sheets. So I, I'm not, and Brittany may have other information. I don't know that we had reached out to National Journal early enough to get those. And if, and that's, I guess, something we might take offline, but I don't know that we'll have those or have those in time for the summit this year. And do we have forms for the people to fill out to return to us about the successes or the challenges of their visits? You want to? Yeah, so we normally, so I'm glad you mentioned that too. So in our toolkit, Richard, uh, that's one of the things that we discuss about uh, as, as a member, as a member of NAEP, if you end up getting a uh, Hill visit with a staffer or a member and stuff, we just ask that you reach back out to the uh, NAEP organization and say, hey, we visited with uh, the member from X state or his or her staffer, and here's the what we here's what we shared about topic wise. That gives us an opportunity then to also follow up with that particular member uh, about our priorities and uh, because the whole idea of a relationship with a member, it's great your first time to DC to meet with a member or their staff, and that's exciting uh, as to understand how democracy works and then actually to be a part of that. Uh, but it's it's more about if it's just about a one time thing, there's not a real long term benefit to that. It's really about building the relationship over time. I think the reference we always use is it's a marathon and not a sprint. So if you meet with those folks, uh, you may only come once a year or you, this may be your only visit to DC. And so you can continue that conversation or that relationship building through email or phone calls afterwards. But we can also take that opportunity to say, oh, yes, so and so from X state met with you uh, April 11th and uh, we want to follow up with that. And so we can then continue and I'm, I'm looking at Richard as our public policy director that gives him an opportunity kind of an open door if you will to start talking to that member of their staff and then that gives him a foot in so he's not such a stranger right he's he's someone from the same organization that you met that you were from that met with with a member so uh, we will if we have not shared that yet that's something we'll share with you as we get tools together for you all and it helps us uh, serve as a clearinghouse so when when we can compile that in a central location it helps us to compile information that ultimately, hopefully, will help you. Michael, I want to draw your attention to a question in the chat uh, from Jessica Drews. Is there any materials from NAEP that you'd recommend to use for meeting with uh, our reps? So quick, yeah, so short answer is yes. So those would be what we would... We typically would have one pagers that have ended up being four pages long uh, from National Journal and basically those summed up career and technical education that's going on in every state. So if you were going, so Richard is in Maryland. So if Richard was going to his Maryland senator or house member, we would provide them with that 
quote unquote one pager that's four pages long about education, career and technical education, secondary and post-secondary within the state of Maryland. Because what we, we, um, we try to encourage our members from Nate to be resources to legislators because there are plenty of people that go in, in and out of those legislative offices that have an ask. There's the number is dramatically lower the people that walk in the door and are a resource for the legislator. And so that has always been some of my, uh, the, the increased number of feedback where legislators or their staffers call me back is when I present them with something that is a resource. So the short answer is yes. Uh, we've got to we've got to have off uh, line conversations about if we have those one pagers this year or if at a minimum uh, Richard has compiled um, the priorities, the, the legislative priorities for Nate. And so we definitely will make those available on the website uh, for you to utilize as well. So as we provide those things on the website to, and we draw that your attention to that as we send out these materials next week. Uh, if there's other things that you're looking for, please reach out to us and, and respond to that email and also let us know. Thank you, Richard, for dropping that in there. You can email Richard directly. And if there's something else that you need that's not already provided on the website, then we will be happy to provide that for you. Uh, Michael, uh, I'm just going to ask Brittany since she's here with us. She said we do have them this year. Is that the fact? No, I didn't ask. No, no. Okay. All right. Thank you. So Mimi asked about talking points. So yes, uh, Mimi, that goes along with the same question. So along with the um, legislative priorities and talking, those will, slash talking points will be included in that document, that quote unquote one pager that Richard will make sure is on our website. And again, once this, this uh, presentation is released, we'll also be with the supplemental materials and that'll be one of those with the, with the link uh, and the, kind of the title of talking points or legislative priorities for uh, congressional members. Excellent questions. All right, Richard, welcome aboard. We are excited for you to be to be on board. Looking forward for this being your first time in D.C. as far as uh, summit uh, the day on the hill. So we look as much as you being there this year. Looking forward to your wheels spinning and looking how we can make that better for next year based upon your experience and then in, actually in having the day occur. Um, and so we're looking forward to that. Brittany, I'm going to turn it over to you to dismiss it or anything you want to say before we turn it over to Gregory to dismiss us. No, nothing from me. You can turn it back over to Gregory. All right, Gregory, thank you for giving us time today to uh, discuss with members about what we're looking forward to at the summit. You're on mute. I'm going to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and thank you, everybody. I'm just going to keep it short and sweet. Um, just want to give you all a heads up to look out for Mar uh, May 15th for supporting English language learners for our next member series. Uh, that's a really important topic. And we're really excited because we're going to have Nate members doing some great work uh, in Texas and New Mexico. We've been invited to present on some of their um, work in this area. So um, we look forward to having you in May, and I look forward to an opportunity to meet um, all of you uh, in D.C. if you're going to be in town. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. All right, first one. Okay.